that you want to explore and something that's right for you and your career. Um, our panelists for this topic are our distinguished faculty from our department and two special guests. Um, I'll start with the faculty from our department, um, Professor Stephen Marcus, Isaac Maragot, Carol S. Wilson, Marty Pickerer, and we have a special guest, Dominic Corte, who is an alum of the department. He's currently um, a, an assistant professor at the University of Florida, and his um, technical areas are hardware security and trust. Um, we're expecting one more panelist to join us, who is Siswani Sarkar, and she um, completed her PhD in 2000, in 2000 with um, Leandris Tosiolis. Um, actually, I should mention that Dominic completed his um, PhD. Here's Siswani. Um, Dominic completed his PhD in 2013 with Ankur Svasta, our beloved Ankur Svasta sitting in the corner over there. Um, <laughs> and um, Siswani is going to join us as well. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Um, here's your um, she's, um, she's currently at the, she's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and her um, research area is in communication networks. So um, I'd like to get started by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves to you and just say a few words about maybe why they chose an academic career path and what, kind, what are the most relevant considerations for making that decision that you can make up for young people who are trying to start um, that kind of career planning. So I'll just start with Professor Marcus. So I'm Steve Marcus. Uh, I am in my 44th year of being a university professor. Um, I was uh, on the faculty Um, it's a wonderful career. I uh, went into teaching, into being a university professor, um, partly because I had a mentor. I was an undergraduate at Rice University, and I did my PhD at MIT. So when I was an undergraduate, I had a wonderful mentor, and I essentially wanted to be this person. Anyway, um, he was, um, I didn't know anything about research when I was undergraduate. That long ago, nobody knew anything about research when they were in at least not where I was. Um, but he was a wonderful teacher and um, really helped all of us a lot. And so I decided to go get a PhD because I wanted to teach. For me, my decision to being a university professor was all about teaching. Um, at least at the beginning, I didn't know anything about it, so I got the grant. Um, I, uh, there was, um, when I graduated from MIT, I got one job interview. Um, it turned out there was one job in the country at a major university. Um, My name is Isaac Mayer Boyles, as you can sense from my accent, 
they came from the subsequently expired Soviet Union about 38 years ago. Yeah, more than 38 years ago. Yeah. I became first professor in the Soviet Union, assistant professor, in Penza Polytechnic Institute. Because I graduated from the University of Novichokas Polytechnic Institute as one of the first, and in the Soviet Union, they, you do not look for a job, they assign you a job. I never dreamed to be a professor, although I came from the family where my father was professor of medicine. My aunts were professors of medicine. My uncle was professor of Moscow University. But I never think about it. I played soccer, and I thought that would be my career. <laughs> then I started, uh, I got involved in research in my own, mostly in mathematics at the beginning, when I was in Kansas Polytechnic Institute, and published some papers. And I loved this job, actually. And then I moved to Kiev, where I was born and raised. And uh, there, it was not possible for me to get a professorial job because of my Jewish identity. And then I worked in the Institute of Cybernetics of Ukrainian Academy of Science. I came to this country, it's very interesting. I would like to say this, maybe this is the only opportunity I will have. 38 years ago, we were settled in Langley Park, which is not far away, with little money, but a lot of hope. And I learned about the University of Maryland nearby. And we didn't have money to buy a ticket for a bus. I didn't know how to do it. And I walked at the University of Maryland. And I walked, and first I saw, before I saw engineering school, I saw mathematics department. Because I have some degree in mathematics as well, I went there. I spoke barely understandable English, but I was introduced to Professor Stuart Antman, who knows, who knows Russia. And it was luck that somehow the people I knew in Russia, such mathematicians like Krasnoselsky, he was involved in research related to it. We had very interesting discussion. And he brought me to the office of the chairman. At that time, chairman was William Kerman. Nobody called him William Carroll at that time, they called him Brit, Brit Carroll. We spoke about 30, 40 minutes, and he hired me. So I was hired literally off the street. Of course, when they hired me, he then introduced me to Lee Davison, and they told me that they would take me to one semester. And uh, they told me very good thing. They told me there is no future for you. Go and look for a job. And I looked for a job and uh, was interviewed at the General Electric Research and Development Center. At that time, they were involved in the design of MRI devices. And I knew that nobody would be interested in what I did in Russia, about research. And I took the risk and asked them, do you have the problem you cannot solve it? Let me try. And they gave me the problem. I sweat it for two weeks. I solved it. And they gave me an offer when I showed to my colleagues here at the University of Melbourne, nobody could believe it. You see, for the time, an industry paid much higher than the university. And that's opened for me the opportunity to become a professor here. I got tenure in four months, and then become a professor. I love this job. I couldn't believe it better job. Of course, the salary which they gave me it was much smaller, two times smaller than general records. And, uh, but I, they used to joke, Professor, you are still made the right decision. I've usually been desperate, you look like to lose your job. When she saw my offer, she told me, go back and leave. We shared the office, and I did. And then later on, when I used to disagree, when he was in the position of the dean, and argue with him, and uh, I why am not wasting my time with you? He wanted me to leave, and he will answer, now I regret very much that you <laughs> but anyway, I love this job. I could not imagine better job. And the question can be asked, why people like the profession of professor? It's very personal. Different people like different things. If you will ask me, I will put two major things here. First, it will be pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. That you have this academic freedom that you can do and pursue knowledge for its own sake, to, to 
open your horizons and second teach and I wouldn't separate these two duties from one another all God's love to teach you and uh, and my advice to you if you, that's what you want to do to pursue knowledge for its own sake diversify your knowledge you will never do the same thing as you started when you were young you have to change area many times during your professional career. And the professorial position is for you if you'd like to put your knowledge by its own sake and you love it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Margaret. Um, Carol. So, um, like Steve and Professor Margot, I love teaching and I love research. I knew I loved teaching even when I was in high school because I did a lot of tutoring of other students and I enjoyed that. And I had decided at that point that someday I wanted to be a professor because I didn't want to work with kids my age at that time. I was like, high schoolers are too difficult. I want more mature students who have grown up some. <laughs> and so um, I decided to go for my PhD and um, decided during my master's thesis that I really and love research as well. The creative process of it, um, trying to figure out how to turn a corner, um, think about it a different way, I enjoyed that. And so um, I actually had Bell Laboratories that sent me to get my master's uh, at MIT. And I decided, and it was a one year on campus program, but they gave me two years at MIT because they, uh, you had to do a uh, thesis. And I didn't want to leave to go back. You're supposed to go back and work at Bell Labs. Uh, and I told them they had another program for, for students getting PhDs. And I asked if I could go to that program. And they said, well, you need to come and work a couple of years, and then we'll see you back. And I just decided, if I leave, I may never make it back. So I went and talked to the dean of graduate studies at MIT and told him that I really wanted to stay on for my PhD. And, um, he picked up the phone and called people at Xerox. I went up there and interviewed and got a fellowship from Xerox. And so they paid for my PhD, which was great. Um, and so I really enjoyed the PhD. I joined a different group at that point that the other group I'd been in had been all males. Uh, this one had a lot of women and guys in it. And it actually had more women in it than guys. It was a speech communication group, so you had a lot of, a lot of post stops came there and so you had linguists and phoneticians and psycholinguists and all kinds of folks and it was just a great environment. I uh, really loved it and thought, wow, I would love to be able to create this kind of atmosphere myself and have students to work with. Um, so I was debating between becoming a professor or going to work at Bell Laboratories because I knew a lot of signal processing folks that had careers at Bell Labs and then got tenured positions at, at universities. I knew I wanted to end up at a university, but I thought going that route might be great because I get to publish a lot so that I could go to the university with me and avoid the tenure track. Because <laughs> I heard a lot of stories about the tenure track, but, but because I got married before I finished grad school and the two body problem, it turned out best for me to stay in Cambridge. So I took a uh, job as a professor at BU for a while, and then I came here in 2009. But I really love the academy, uh, the freedom, uh, in so many ways. Uh, you get to work on what you're really passionate about, the problems that you really care about, nobody's telling you what to work on. Uh, you meet great people and have you know, great colleagues to work with. And then you have these wonderful, amazing students <laughs> that you learn from as well you know and so and you get to make your it's almost like having your own company in a way because you're in control of all of that and you make it as diverse as you want to make it which was really important for me um so and the flexibility that you get as a professor was very important to me because i raised three children while being a professor and being able to juggle those things and and still be able to if I wanted to, if, as long as it was, I didn't have a teaching conflict or a committee conflict, if there was a play in the middle of the day, why they do that, I don't know, but they do. Uh, 
you might get a chance to go and see it, you know, because you have a flexible schedule. You know, you're working all the time uh, when you're a professor. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's true for all of my colleagues. You're going to bed with problems on your mind and you're solving them constantly, right? So um, that may be the downside because it's a lot to juggle. Um, there's always something to do. You know, there's a paper to write, there's a grant to write, uh, a lecture. There's always stuff to work on. So there's never a time where you, you say, I really have nothing. <laughs> you don't know what, so we never know what that feels like. There's always something that you should be doing. Um, but once you learn how to take time off, even in spite of having a lot of things to do, uh, because you need that to stay healthy, then you're okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. As you both said, yes. Um, shall we just continue down the line? Sure. Professor Forte. So yeah, I had a very roundabout way of becoming a professor and entering academia. Um, I went to a small school for undergrad, uh, Manhattan College. And uh, I, I guess like, like Steve, I've you know, been attracted to it because I thought it was more about teaching. And uh, I thought it would be good to get a PhD and to go into that. Um, but uh, when I came to the university and I started actually TAing, I was a little bit less <laughs> attracted to that. Um, and uh, I actually left grad school, grad school for a while and, uh, and entered the workforce and uh, tried that out. And uh, luckily, around that time, I actually found my advisor and uh, we started working together. And uh, you know, at first, again, I wasn't too drawn to research. I was kind of afraid a bit of the, the vagueness that was involved. Um, but after, over time, I, I grew to really appreciate it and to really like that, like the independence of, um, of research, as, as the fellow panelists have said. And um, you know, even, even when I was close to graduation, I wasn't 100% sure that I wanted to be a professor or not because of all the responsibility that came along with it. Um, but I, uh, it's definitely been one of the best decisions I ever made. I'm very happy, and uh, I really enjoy coming to work every day. I don't think I could say that about any other job that I've had in the past or that I, I would have had. And uh, it's, you know, it's very fulfilling and, and um, uh, great, great, great job uh, working with the students, uh, brainstorming with students and colleagues. Um, I work in a very large multidisciplinary group, um, so we really are at the cutting edge and. Um, are really leaders in the field, and you know, if I were in industry or in any other positions, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that chance. So I really like being a professor. Thank you very much, Professor. So I'm just going to mention that um, as I transitioned to my esteemed colleague, Professor Pepper, um, somehow we managed on on this table seating to have all of the people who aren't University of Maryland alums on one side, and all of the people who are University of Maryland alums on the other side. So I'll just mention. My, um, my colleague, Professor Pekar, is also a University of Maryland alum. And let's ask him for why he well, became a professor. Well, I've had a, a very, as you can see by looking at me, a very long career. Uh, uh, 50 years, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, I've taught uh, at the University of various capacities for 38 years. And, uh, but I have worked uh, in all of the uh, areas that, uh, that are listed. started out uh, working in government and uh, uh, more like a professor in fire place. Uh, I was uh, also assigned by the government. <laughs> uh, I had two choices. Okay. One was an office in downtown Vietnam uh, and the other uh, was uh, um, to do some form of government work. And so I worked at NASA uh, as a uh, uh, subsequent Right. 
prerequisites uh, for being a university. Okay? You have to really want to teach. Okay? But then there is this other concept over here. It's a concept, which is research. Okay? Um, research in all of the three organizations that I mentioned has different connotations. Uh, in, in, in industry, for example, uh, if you uh, when you do research, you, you're looking out for how to do something that somebody wants, so that the company can make a business. Okay, and that's research. Okay, now, uh, uh, at the university, though, the, the concept is more about ideas, and, uh, uh, and and this definition is also variable from school to school. What I liked about Maryland was uh, the ability, I, I could have discussions about ideas with, with just anybody in, in on faculty. And I didn't have uh, uh, the competitiveness issues that, were, that I encountered in industry. Uh, it was just the ability to, to, to follow a concept to its conclusion. And hopefully it'll lead to a paper. Uh, I do want to say that a, a requisite for success in the, uh, in the university is, is, is publication. And you're going to have to publish if you want to do a do university job. You have to want to uh, engage in that activity. I know I have to say my son taught at the uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, and that earned him. So, uh, I, uh, Let me just also address one other issue. Uh, there was a big push, uh, I guess, uh, the whole two years uh, for uh, uh, university personnel and their students to work in uh, uh, entrepreneurial pursuits. Okay. Uh, I, I tend to think that that's kind of adverse to, uh, to, to the way I see the university. And, uh, uh, it, it, if you're going to develop uh, a business uh, I enjoyed it and I had an excellent mentor too. 
So, but it was really the research, the enjoyment in the research, and it was also, I found research to be a very obsessive experience. That is, when I would uh, uh, get into a problem, I would just be able to think about the problem. Nothing else, uh, even when, let's say, I'm walking or I'm seeing some sight or maybe even when I'm in an opera, hearing music, so I was still, a part of me would be thinking about the problem. So it was a very obsessive experience for me. Uh, but then, at that point, uh, I felt that I really needed to do more of this research. Hence, I went to PhD. Even at that point, I did not uh, know or I didn't even, uh, I did not know that I wanted to become an academic. I mean, I didn't, I was not really thinking about the uh, subsequent step, but it was really the enjoyment of the academic atmosphere which was building up. And then I came to Maryland, and that enjoyment with research, with courses continued. That uh, here I found that I could do a whole lot of, whole lot of courses, I mean, again, all of them, many of them were quite challenging, but at the same time, extremely satisfying, same for the research. And I, at that point, and I also did an internship at IBM, uh, I mean, which was good, I, uh, I liked them, they liked me, but I realized that that is not exactly the kind of research I want to do. It's, uh, it, it would be, I mean, research that I wanted to do would have a significant knowledge component rather than a specific deliverable component. So I would like to be able to define my own problems. And uh, interestingly, up to that point, I had never taught. Uh, the first time I taught was after I became an academic. So in some sense, it was a huge gamble that I really did not. I took up the uh, profession without knowing all components of it. So uh, I decided to be an academic simply because I enjoyed research. But subsequently, I mean, as I went through the years in academia, I joined uh, University of Pennsylvania in 2000, which is 18 years from now. I mean, I guess <laughs> most of you were kids then. So, uh, but subsequent to that, I uh, I started enjoying or started realizing what the process of working with others, uh, I mean, working with younger people, which is actually a very important component of academic numbers. And I started, uh, I gradually enjoyed I had no teaching experience, no exposure to teaching myself. I had just taken some courses which I really liked. Uh, so, but teaching was not a part of my decision process towards joining that. So, but I think it is important. I agree with everyone here says that teaching is a very really important part of your decision and should be. So, in fact, if you are seriously thinking of an academic profession, I would encourage you to do a TA, at least a TA. And try to get an exposure to that, and also, uh, the, I mean, uh, you need to be able to, you need to enjoy working with young people, even PhD students. Uh, when you join academia, they're probably, I mean, right now they're a lot younger than me, but at that point they were <laughs> sort of not not that younger than me, but took maybe a few years off, but still they're younger. I mean, in terms of academic things, so the, I mean, we need to have the ability to bring ourselves down to the st starting point of a, of a young PhD student and we need to take ourselves back to that, which I don't think I myself do very well even now, but I think that is an important point and we need to enjoy that. Now, after joining academia, I mean, I never regretted that uh, decision. I think I took a very good decision. And that's why I keep coming back <laughs> to this panel to encourage everyone to consider that profession. Uh, I mean, other than, of course, the research is very uh, uh, enjoyable, but also, I guess I could have done research if I were in a research lab too. But what differentiates is this here, I can essentially choose the field. For example, I mean, I, uh, in a few years, I get tired of a field, or I mean, a few years, maybe at least five or six years, I, uh, I get tired of something that I've been working in. That, that's just my personal. So, but uh, I can work in other fields. Right now, for example, I'm collaborating with an expert, uh, expert in transportation research, another expert in medicine, uh, a public health researcher who is also a medical doctor. So, I'm collaborating, I'm learning uh, new tools or new domain, uh, problem domains from them, and hopefully I'm also uh, introducing them to some new techniques. So, so this uh, the opportunity to learn every day, to learn new fields, and also to be introduced to new fields by students. I mean, uh, most of my students, at least the best amongst them, have all introduced me to new areas, which I had not been uh, pursuing before. I think these, these are invaluable. In addition, some of you may have, uh, you want to do other things, like I think uh, you mentioned, right, based on kids. So I didn't 
broad phrase indeed, but I have a wide variety of interests. I mean, as I mentioned, in academia, various different fields, but not just that, completely outside academia. I, mean, I can talk about those at some other venue, but I have very different areas of interest. I have, uh, you know, uh, opinions in different fields, and I feel I should have the uh, freedom to express them. And for me, academia is unused, because no one, uh, I mean, we have uh, uh, an academic independence which extends to you know, other things, so I'm able to accommodate my other interests as also able to express myself in other fields without any professional task. So I think these are uh, what, that is, if you find yourself a diverse person, because academia is really a very, I mean, you will find Thanks to all our panelists for their lovely introductions. I'd like to give you a chance to ask your questions about whether uh, what, what, what don't you know about an academic career and how an academic career would, 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 map, would map to your life? Do you want to ask about the responsibilities of being an academic or work-life balance or tenure? What are your questions? I can keep asking questions. <laughs> yes? How does it feel like to be a new professor? What are the differences between being a professor and more responsibilities? How does it feel? Is it like a lot of pressure right at the beginning? So perhaps we can start with our one assistant professor and then have some answers from our more seasoned colleagues. Well, um, I would say I was very lucky. Uh, when I started my position, I began actually at the University of Connecticut, former the University of Florida. I was very lucky to have a very good mentor um, as, a, as, a, as a faculty mentor. And, uh, definitely helped uh, me reach my potential very, very early. In fact, I never felt a lot of that pressure that I think a lot of other people uh, tend to feel. And uh, it really accelerated uh, my growth in general. And uh, from what I've heard, um, it's become far more competitive in terms of friends and things like that. But like, you know, like all things, I mean, your first publications are not easy. They don't come easy. You get better at them. And you get better at writing grants. You get better at mentoring your students. And uh, that's, that's actually part of the fun in many ways. Uh, no student is the same. Every student is different. And um, it, it kind of keeps you on your toes. Um, and you know, a very interesting thing these days about being a young professor is I think that uh, they're trying to encourage a lot of things these days. Entrepreneurship is one. Um, but multidisciplinary research is quite another. And you know, that keeps, gets us out of our holes, right? We're not working in our own silos anymore. A lot of us are working together now. And uh, that, that, again, makes things actually fun to be an assistant professor these days. Does anyone else care to share a reflection about the Well, there is, there is the pressure at the beginning that um, in your, at most places, in your sixth year, um, you, uh, the university, your department, and the college, and the university, vote on whether you should get tenure. So one type of pressure is that you have five years to kind of show what you can do. You have five years to show that you can do significant research and publish, um, which is all that much more pressure because uh, papers don't get published the day they're submitted. There's a long lead time and and you are expected to get grants. There's, there's a whole lot of time there. Um, you're expected to work with PhD students if you're at a research university and show that you can do that in a way that students will be able to move along toward their degree. That also takes time. So one of, when I was chair of the ECB department, one of the things I worked with as a student professor at 14 minutes, um, was, uh, it's, if you haven't been through it, it's hard to realize how short a time five years is to get these things done. So just trying to make sure that everybody got going in all of these different aspects. So there's, you know, you're learning to juggle various things, teaching and research. You want to do a really good job teaching, but you could spend, if you chose, all of your time on your teaching, perfecting your class notes. Um, one assistant professor is 
said, I'm going to have my door open to students all the time. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> you actually have to allocate your time so you have lots of time when you actually can think and write. And so there's a lot going on uh, at the beginning. One of the things that does, as, as Dominic has said, one of the things that's really huge is if you have good mentors who help you through that process. You know, the department chair and other senior faculty in the department. Um, so if you are looking for a job, look for that too. Um, uh, it's good to be in a place that's big enough that have a range of senior people to help you. Well, I just think that mentorship is key, just like Steve just said. Um, and you can have several mentors. Um, and, you know, usually you're given a break when you first start. You're not asked maybe to teach for a semester or four years that you can spend some time trying to get your research program going. Um, so people are cognizant, everybody understands the pressure that you're under. And so they may, they put things in place to help you. Uh, you can ask for a three-year review uh, committee to just see where you are so you know what areas you need to beef up. Um, and it, Many universities will have a three-year review, but if they don't, you can ask that. You can put you know, three professors together that you really respect and have them critique you. Um, and you have to learn how to you know, prioritize your time. And some things you may have to say no to, things that you really care about and that you want to do, but you realize this may not be the right time while you're doing your tenure track. Um, and you, there's a way to say no without angering people and letting them know you really care about this and you plan to do it down the road. But people will respect if you say, you know, I'm trying to uh, work on my scholarship right now and to prioritize, you know, whatever it is you're trying to prioritize. Uh, people will respect that. Uh, so it's doable. That was a great question. Are there any other questions about aspects of whether academia might be the right career path for you? Uh, I have just started my PhD this fall. And so when I uh, think about going into a community, there is no way to go. But now it's still my idea about going to do uh, after five or six years. I just feel confused that I don't know what I'll do. Like, there are so many ways, like, um, you stay in academia or going to join an industry or any government job, career job.
Is that is that a path that you could have foreseen, or were there a lot of unexpected shifts along the way? So I mean, uh, I had no idea what I, as I was explaining, that uh, I had to, until the next step. For example, you were asking about your, your first year, right? First year for your PhD. I mean, personally, I didn't even think what I would do. I mean, uh, I just wanted to do a good PhD thesis. So that may be uh, one way to look at it. I'm not saying that's the only way. There are, of course, different uh, evolutions. Some, I mean, I think there's been some other study you already knew from uh, the one that what you wanted to do. But I think there is another career path which happens uh, without knowing what you want to do. Uh, because also, I believe the information at this point, you may not have sufficient information to make that decision at this point, because you've just started your PhD, right? So you probably haven't defined your thesis problem. You don't know any PhD would be your really first experience of serious research for an extended duration. In master's, you could do master's thesis, but it would be for probably maybe a year. But uh, PhD would be for uh, several years, so I think only maybe towards the middle, on the middle, you will have an idea of how you are enjoying the process. And if you are, I mean, if it is going to be a research university, of course there are some teaching tracks, that's different. But then if it's a research university, you step up uh, life, step up academic life, or a large part of your academic life would comprise of research. So you need to uh, passionately love research. And you know that towards the middle. Uh, I mean, that's my view. I mean, you know that towards the middle or beyond the middle. So I think you are <laughs> perfectly <laughs> not, <laughs> not to do so. I mean, uh, my take at this point would be just to uh, continue doing what you're doing. And you're here because you have been judged good. That's why you're here. So you should just continue that path and things will become clear. And also, unless until you're sure, it's always a good idea to keep all options open. Because, and you should, I strongly recommend that at some point you should do an internship. Even if, even if after that, internship in a research lab or, or a company, that even if after that you decide you want to do it. I mean, I did that myself. And only after doing that it became clear to me. I mean, I enjoyed that experience. I liked the people there, they liked me too. But after that it became clear to me that that is not what I want to do for a living. At least at that point. So I think uh, you should just keep an open mind and try and get uh, as much information as possible. And I expect things to become clearer beyond uh, a mere half a month. Did you know, could, could you have predicted where you are today based on your first year of graduate school? Oh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs>
a proposal yet written that got funded. So did I. Yeah. Got, got, got. <laughs> so you have a model. That's right. Yeah. So for me, it was almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> of uh, 
starting a research lab because they have to have a lot of equipment in my lab and we had this technician Keith who just took care of everything when I was a PhD <laughs> student you didn't have to worry about anything and then all of a sudden I have to set up a lab that was kind of daunting initially but I just took advantage of all the people that I knew and made phone calls and went over and talked to Keith and talked to my my thesis advisor to get all that information so you just have to be you know have a sense of agency and really Use everybody you know, <laughs> you know, to help you get started. So, I think what's coming up here uh, is the importance of a thesis advisor. You know, having a thesis advisor that you can relate to uh, and uh, that is uh, responsive to your needs. And uh, uh, I was very fortunate that my thesis advisor here was Professor Lynn. Maybe in your career path, maybe it's long or short. There are some. Sometimes there will be new like technologies or concepts like will come up, such like in the recent years, machine learning or blockchain or so on and so forth. So how do you deal with concepts like these? Uh, do you uh, want to like uh, write the proposals that relate your research to those, or you want to stick to your uh, previous maybe more relevant? Research topics, what do Well, that was a big issue for me, uh, machine learning coming along, because it's just kind of disrupted digital signal processing, <laughs> right? And so you have to explore. You got to read, you got to try it out and see what are the pros and the cons and figure out if you want to integrate that with what you already know uh, and how to integrate that. And I think that's a big area of research is trying to understand what these systems are doing and how to interject knowledge into them, right? And so you can't ignore things like that. Um, but you figure out where your strength is and how you can use it and what you think you can, um, what things that you can help solve, what problems you can help solve using those technologies or even in trying to understand what those technologies are. But it's got to come out of what you, your frame of reference, right? What are the things you're passionate about? Anyone else here adopt new ideas in your research plan? What's your last proposal on machine learning, Steve? <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting. We, um, I've done a lot of work in Markov decision processes coming from a stochastic and it turns out that 
things we developed for those problems ended up being used by the AlphaGo people. Um, and it's, you know, it's very complicated. Uh, yes, you can't ignore those things. And so now we can mention it. And I guess I had to do machine learning because in some sense, I do. Uh, and and uh, artificial intelligence people at some point discovered more composition processes. And so there's a lot of overlap between the fields. Um, but the other thing, this researching things for knowledge's sake. So pro I think the best work I ever did, most original, most interesting, was something I did when I was an assistant professor. And I published it, and it was hardly referenced at all. Uh, got very few citations. And then 20, 30 years later, people in finance discovered it and it became useful to them. And they even gave it a name. Uh, so some of the things, you know, we don't get an immediate payoff a lot of time. I think we do. We do things that we are really fascinated with. And we publish them. And sometimes much later they become really useful. So there are two vehicles of learning. 
other than uh, I mean, uh, collaborations on proportion, which is important. So one is sabbatical, the, and the other is doctoral students. Uh, so you learn on the <laughs> on your own. and it 
excellent way to start getting to know people, senior people in your research, uh, in your research area, other than your advisor and other than the professors in, uh, in the department. And I found that very useful because after uh, I joined the academic planning, uh, I realized that many of the uh, many of the eminent uh, researchers and faculty members whom I met as a student, they still remember. So, uh, which was quite a few years back, so we were meeting very different people, but they just happened to uh, remember me. And as such, networking with them, connecting with them in subsequent conferences became easier. So, uh, these are the opportunities you might want to look for, that is whether there are colloquium uh, CDs which are hosted by students, if that's the case, then you should definitely volunteer for those because that would be very useful. And if your advisor may also be uh, inviting others for talk, for talks or uh, you know, just for spending and visiting researcher for, for spending some time in his lab, please make a point to get to know them and very likely uh, and describe and discuss your research with them and very likely they are going to remember you in the future and it will be easier for you to Quite a few more people that joined in because we were doing well together. 
you know, we were always lab mates. Um, and so that helped that somebody else reached out to me. I don't know, I mean, I, I hope that I would have gotten comfortable enough to reach out to someone else, but luckily he reached out to me and then that expanded the group. And that made me a lot more comfortable because I got to know people as people, you know, that were different races and, you know, different gender. Um, and so that helped a lot. Um, and of course, you know, in grad school, there were very few as well, women or uh, African Americans. Um, but again, I loved the work, and I knew I wanted to be a professor, so you just figured that out. <laughs> and I'm quite comfortable now. I mean, it, it took some a while, uh, but um, you learn how to navigate and you put the things in place that you know, makes life enjoyable for you. Can I throw in a related question? Yes. Um, if you're a woman faculty member, is it important to find women mentors? Yes. And I remember I went to, I can't think of her name now, but um, um, even when I was thinking about becoming a professor, I went and talked to some senior people at MIT, women professors who had been successful. It wasn't her. I was, she was just remarkable. <laughs> but Mary Rowe, actually, is the person that I went and spoke to and just asked her about navigating that whole, you know, you know, sort of even, even how, you, how do you have a family and navigate this world? Uh, because, you know, there are a lot of people that have I mean, I remember there's one chair that I had that did not feel people should have children, especially not while they're on the tenure track. <laughs> you met that guy. That's, That's why she didn't come to the university that I was at. <laughs> this is true. So, and here I was. I, I started when I when I was became a professor. I already had twin girls, and then I had the nerve to have get pregnant with my son while I was on the tenure track. So you know, <laughs> that went over really well. I know. But you know, you can't, you have to live your life. You, you have to define what your life is going to be and take control of that and not let other people have that power to decide how your life goes. You gotta do what you feel is right. So. Just a question, do you think the Me Too movement is improving the situation for uh, women in academia? Not yet. <laughs> it takes time to just start at that moment. Um, there, I will mention. I just want to throw in one thing about this, which is we have a bunch of wonderful women faculty in this department. And, <laughs> and so, so women PhDs. What? Oh, ah, that's good. Yeah, we came the same year. So, uh, women who are PhDs. Thinking about being faculty, especially, talk to them. Do yeah. what Carol did when she was at MIT. Going, they're available to you. I'm sure they would love to talk to you. And they'll talk to the guys too. But yeah. <laughs> you get a different perspective. And let, let me just mention that we all want all Maryland students to succeed, right? Yes. Like you don't just like your your advisor should be a good mentor to you, but all of the faculty in our department are your mentors as well. So, you know, okay, so before we start the next session, we're, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna make you all move up because we really don't fight. I promise we won't fight at least for a day. So. <laughs> Is there a question over here? Is there a question? Yes. So, you hear about professors who maybe don't like remarks, but they are a lot of research over there. How about if you're not so sure There are schools where you probably really focus on teaching, yeah. like the swap right? I mean, there are people who do research there, but I think the main priority, teaching is a higher priority in terms of getting tenure than doing research. So there are schools that are more, not Holyoke is another one. Right? There are lots of it, there are lots of them that are that. undergraduate only. Yeah. And they tend to focus much more strongly on teaching and undergraduate scholarship than on the research activity of graduate school. 
and there's Harvey Mudd, there's, uh, you know, there are a number of very good the schools. schools. They yeah. have great undergraduate programs. And, and a lot of them have like master's programs, maybe not PhD programs, and you are expected to do research. Um, and one of the ways you can do that is team up with faculty at places like this and spend summers at places like this. Um, and, and a lot of them engage their undergrads in research. Yeah, they have, a lot of these places have really good undergraduates and they yes. get involved in research. So that's a, it's a path I would encourage everybody to think about. Um, a lot of our students don't even consider those places, but just to ask me about that so that you know uh, the availability of like so many good online courses these days, especially like at the area level. So how do you think like you know teaching would be in the future, like the importance of teaching? What effect would have that effect? Would that always be like a supplemental material or is like that can become like the main thing that's being done? I don't think it can. I don't think any of these substitutes for the classrooms. I think some of my students are even watching a lecture of some other professor while they take the class. <laughs> so. Well, I think, you know, one of the things is if, so let's say, that your lecture is, and I had, I had colleagues not here, but elsewhere who did this. The lecture was essentially reading out of the book and writing out of the book on the board, right? And very little interaction with the class. If that's what teaching is, then it would, that would be supplanted by it. But if we are doing our job as faculty and we really create interactive environments and we do whatever we can to get students to come into our office hours and do all sorts of personal interactions with them. I don't think that can be substituted. By uh, years ago, uh, when I started out, uh, my goal was to be a high school physics teacher. And so I took uh, methods and materials to the graduate teaching certification for high school. But, um, one of the studies I did back then, I found very interesting. I, I, don't, I can't give you the reference right now, it was 50 years ago. But the main, the, the main correlative of success for a student uh, in, in understanding Any other thoughts on whether we're going to be replaced by MOOCs? 
<laughs> I think I think that one of the opportunities in and I'll take the I'll take the the, the opportunity to say um, one of the opportunities in academia with the freedom that we have is and, and the reason why we won't be replaced by MOOCs is is because part of our job is new knowledge creation and part of what you should be bringing into the classroom is that new knowledge creation, is new field creation. And that's why we won't be replaced by MOOCs. I mean, some of, some of what we do will be commoditized, for sure. But um, I don't think that this endeavor will be completely commoditized ever. Partially because of the personal contact. Um, I mean, I have colleagues, I have very strong co contacts with collaborators in Europe, for example. And my, collab my collaborators in Europe spend about twice as much time in the classroom for a given class as I do. Like there are twice as many contact hours associated with a specific class as for our typical equivalent class. So that personal contact is really important. Yeah. And then a lot of these students, I mean, they get really engaged with you and they end up doing research in your lab. Sometimes they volunteer their time. They're not even looking to be paid. They just come in and they learn from you and the grad students. No. Okay, we have time for one more question. If there's one more question. I guess one of the big determinants from my career, uh, I, I heard is like funding. And I know somebody mentioned that sometimes you have to change to follow where the fund is. But then you're kind of losing the intellectual and academic freedom that you chose the career for. So how much of the painfulness of this? Or it's not painful because you are supplemented by research funding that's available for basic I don't know. I, don't know. I think it, can, it makes you actually more creative. Because I remember um, a program officer actually suggesting a different area for us to think about. She wanted people to work on some specific problems because of what she was seeing. And, you know, we put our heads together, and that's something that has turned into some really exciting research for us. Um, so it's not necessarily that you're giving up what you really love. You're learning how to take what you really love and maybe and apply it in a new way or solve a new problem using the tools that you've developed or what have you. So it doesn't have to be something like totally different from what you've been doing. I can say something similar, but in slightly different words. I mean, the, the idea is that you could bring that research to you, or you could bring yourself to the research trade for that area. And the idea is you, you would want to contribute something new to that area that, that you can only bring. wrap up by thanking our panelists. They've done a really great job <laughs> discussing Okay, we're going to start again in 15 minutes to talk about how to get an academic job. I'm going to make people sit in the front rows. <laughs>